go. So I'm going to begin this paper with a simple question. Why on earth did I get so excited when I finally found this in a shop? <laughs> so this is Chewbacca in his medium sum sum form. It's mass produced so globally by Disney. It's literally a soft toy in which Chewie has become a tube that happens to be slightly bigger than the original sum sums. That question of excitement still comes back to me. Why do fans of pop culture franchises consume so much stuff? Why do we queue, pre-order, collect and curate? Why do we need that material element? So I should begin this paper with an overview of the method, autoethnography. Following this I'll explore a reason why my collecting practices may have begun before providing a quick case study on collecting Doctor Who figures as a teenager. The rest of the paper will be dedicated to exploring themes that emerge in relation to collecting Star Wars Funko Pops. This will begin with excitement, moving on to anxiety, and then shall explore capitalism and consumerism. So the basis of this paper is myself, and I believe that the self is a valid and valuable site to study, and it means that effectively I am my own data set. In order to approach this, I used autoethnography, an exciting methodology that's grounded in postmodern philosophy philosophy, there we go, that seeks to challenge traditional ways of knowing. Although there has been a recognition that researchers often study people, events or settings that are linked to themselves through personal connection, the researcher does not necessarily look inwardly at themselves as a site of study. However, autoethnography seeks to remedy this, exploring personal identity and experience in various ways. As explained by Hoknoken, autoethnography moves beyond being a reflexive practitioner through using personal experience as a medium to explore the social world into which individuals are embedded. I align myself with Ellis and Bochner's declaration that autoethnography is designed to be unruly, dangerous, vulnerable, rebellious and creative, rather than an approach that seeks to be emotionally neutral, objective and with a critical distance. Perhaps my preference or leanings towards reflexive and autoethnographic practice emerges from my own queerness, Mank explores this in her own experience in which being queer constitutes a preference for being othered, resulting in lived experiences that look inwards more readily. As explored by Thomas Dawson, there can be a tendency in archaeology to separate the personal or private from the professional and academic, especially with LGBTQ researchers. Using autoethnography helps to blur and make these supposedly separate spheres indistinct. Autoethnography as a feminist and queer methodology helps to challenge dominant ways of knowing, with the use of narrative helping to reconcile the plurality of experience and truth within lived experiences. Short, Turner and Grant emphasise how it questions, I can never say this word so I don't know why I put it in, positivistic, oh I said it, there we go, epistemologies <laughs> and challenges ideas of grand narratives that claim objective authority, whilst also rejecting the assumed ubiquity of stable meanings existing independently of culture social context and researcher activity and interpretation. However, it is worth noting autoethnography is not without its critics. It has been labelled as self-indulgent and narcissistic, which maybe explains why I like it, by Sparks and by Atkinson. And it's also been deemed a methodology that does not produce valid or valuable results. Indeed, David Reno, who coined the term autoethnography, dismissed it as a valid source of data due to not being applicable to other cultural members and the self. And this highlights an issue where the researcher research is only valuable when it can be generalised. Furthermore, there is tension in the practice of autoethnography between a method that is therapeutic, emotional and self-focused, and one that is rigorous, theoretical and analytical. Anderson argues that autoethnography loses its sociological, or in this case archaeological, potential when it devolves into self-absorption, arguing that scholars should instead adopt an analytical approach. Of course, this tension only exists because of difference in epistemological and ontological ideas. I put forward instead that the emotional, the therapeutic, and the self-focus are not incapable of being academic, and it's important for archaeology to challenge dominant discourse that to be academic means to be objective and or scientific. And that is a photo of my, my right arm, just so you know, that is my own tattoo. So, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I realise that I'm gay. Now these may appear to be unrelated to collecting and curating pop culture, 
but through the process of undertaking a deeply personal and reflexive autoethnography, the two for me seem to coincide and not due to coincidence. Themes of anxiety, discomfort and belonging emerged in what I wrote, and as though I was writing about collecting material culture related to Doctor Who, I found myself returning to my sexuality and my gender. The point, and it's worth emphasising at the start, that the point of these case studies on Doctor Who and then Star Wars is not about finding conclusive results, nor to see this as a traditional research project that can produce generalizable results. It's about starting a conversation on material culture of TV and film in a society that is in flux and expresses itself through purchasing power. So as fif at 15, I, was, I, I had this realization I'm gay, and I was uncomfortable with my masculine gender as well. And it meant feeling like I didn't belong, which might be something common across teenagers generally. For me, it's something I wanted to reject. I felt uncomfortable with my identity. Being a Doctor Who fan, at least in my friendship group, probably not across the school, was acceptable. And on the internet, it was someone to connect with people over. Whilst I couldn't accept my gender and sexuality, I could accept the show, its universe and its merchandise. What I found is that in a period of instability, I could fix identity onto the material, filling my bedroom with stuff to demonstrate without doubt that I am a fan of this show. During this period of realising my sexuality, I was seeking to locate myself in something established, accepted, community orientated. For a Christmas present, I received a subscription to the magazine, with this providing a monthly material interaction with the show. I carefully catalogued them in order and ensured that they were in mint condition as possible. And I still remember the feeling of sadness when my mum told me that she'd recycled them all, <laughs> 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 which literally felt like part of me had also been recycled at that time. I even sought to fix this through my body getting a permanent emblem in a tattoo of a TARDIS, as seen on the previous slide. I got this at 18 in my first year of university, perhaps this displacement from my home bedroom to a new city and new people, generating this new response. Whilst writing, I asked myself to remember the first time I ever bought a Doctor Who figure. I remember visiting Forbidden Planet for the first time in Manchester and seeing the Doctor Who figures. I picked up many of them in the process of deciding, needing to feel it to grasp which one I wanted. That tactile sensation was intrinsic to the process. Eventually I decided to get one of the 10th Doctor, since he was one that got me into the series. So since I've been introduced to Doctor Who through the 10th Doctor, this character, there was and is a strong sense of attachment to him in fact, the first ever piece of Doctor Who merchandise I bought was a poster of the Tenth Doctor, uh, meaning that my choice was perhaps somewhat unsurprising. But what's interesting is the importance of touching and visuals in my decision making. I rarely remember the sound or smell of purchasing, but I associate strongly with that process of interacting, handling and seeing many figures together at the same time. What's interesting about touch being so important in the decision process that I've never actually touched a figure, only the box or packaging. None of my Doctor Who figures have ever left the packaging, and once they're on the shelf, I only touch them to rearrange the collection. Touch becomes absent, with visuality therefore gaining prominence. I wonder how this relates to my sexuality. In my writing, I use words like intimacy and desire to describe the expression, and with... Uh, no, that makes no sense to describe, describe the process of purchasing and with touch being initially the most important aspect of interaction, there is a question I am still unsure of the answer. Where does my sexuality end and my consumerism begin? So one of the key themes that emerged in relation to Star Wars pop figures is excitement. And just to recount the recent tale that happened in November, I waited outside the shop with a friend to see the new merch in person. We'd already waited up to see the images of the merchandise be released the night before. But seeing it in person and the chance for a tactile experience proved alluring. A small group of us, six or seven Star Wars fans, waited outside the Disney shop in York, talking about what we hoped for, for the new film, and most of us had even decided to wear some form of Star Wars related clothing too. The door finally opened and in we went, excitedly walking to the stand. On it were lightsabers, Funko Pops and some mugs, as well as some soft toys. 
Immediately I picked up a Funko Pop of Chewy holding a pork. This is a pork, if you don't know. <laughs> and a feeling washed over me. I have to have it. So thinking about this tale makes me feel a mixture of uncomfortable but also intrigued. What is it what I meant that I had to buy that product? Later in the paper I'll think about such compulsion in relation to capitalism and consumerism. But for now I want to focus on emotion and embodiment. It produced an embodied response. It's strange, but I can still remember audibly gasping, probably looking somewhat like the fog, and having the emotion of excitement mixed with anticipation moving up over me. This may sound odd to people who don't collect or who hate Star Wars, but at least for me, there is that intimate connection between the self and material culture that creates emotion. So there is something about being connected to other people Belonging here can mean having that pop figure as a belonging, but also belonging within a group. Having the same purchase equates to connection. Oh, they like Ray too, or I can't decide between the Imperial Executioner or Luke Skywalker may seem odd statements to people outside of Star Wars fandoms. But these sentences, as is the merchandise, are full of coded meanings in which group identity is built. Like with Doctor Who, help it how it reconciled myself with my queer identity, engaging with Funko Pops has produced a sense of community and stability. A recurring theme in my writing is anxiety and concern over not being a big enough fan and therefore needing to prove that identity. I compensate these feelings of inadequacy through collecting and creating physical material items taking what can be seen as a passive act of watching into something active. Tracking down figures is an active form of engagement, with me choosing to spend time trolling eBay, pop culture websites and geek shops over other activities. Collecting is not just an investment of money, but time. Anxiety is also present in other parts of my life, from larger structural things like the uncertainty of the job market, the rise of the right wing, but also on the simple level of what am I going to choose from the same piece local for my tea. There is comfort in consumerism, the process of seeking and hunting for the next part of the puzzle, the satisfaction when it arrives in the post or is on the shop shelf, but then even this becomes cyclical, that effect wears off, a new wave of pop figures comes out, a new film arrives with everything from coasters and coffee mugs to replica helmets to Chewbacca slippers. Completion becomes unattainable due to the volume. Looking at the range of Star Wars items, the market is saturated. This saturation then leads to a forced decision of selecting one aspect to collect. I chose Funko Pops. Mass produced, relatively cheap, fun depictions of characters. These have proven to be exceptionally popular. What's interesting about Funko Pops is how the boxes are numbered, giving a feeling of exclusivity and satisfaction for having a collection that orders itself offering repetition, satisfaction, insaneness. And this anxiety can spill into other places too. This is my desk in the PhD office. And perhaps it means that I need to extend this feeling of belonging beyond the domestic space, effectively claiming the site of, uh, of identity. And this division between academia and personal becomes indistinct again on the same shelf for books in the French Revolution and historical archeology. span uh, we'll skip that. So, as seen in the post feminism movement, freedom of purchasing power is considered freedom of choice and expression. Obviously, Star Wars generates a phenomenal amount of money. The Last Jedi and its opening in the US alone made $210 million. So, where does consumerism fit into all this? I don't think I can actually answer these questions generally at the moment, but I can note the tension in myself. My t PhD research is on political radicalism and I align myself strongly with left-wing politics, yet I participate in vapid consumerism and what I collect is deeply linked to capitalism. I aim to make radical heritages more known and to develop an actively political archaeology, but participate intimately and regularly with corporate forces. I wrote, and I think it summarises it quite well, perhaps that is part of the appeal, that illusion of choice and self-expression through purchasing. Perhaps I feel like I'm exercising liberty. So in the words of Admiral Akbar, we could view pop culture merchandise as a capitalist trap, getting us to spend money and time on huge franchises. We attempt to buy our identities, 
and we equate purchasing power with freedom of choice and expression. Or we could go for a more an optimistic conclusion and look at how, despite the obvious capitalist and consumerist nature of these franchises, the good that pop culture merchandise can achieve, in my own experience being able to attach an identity to the fixed points of materiality during a time of realisation about sexuality and gender was positive, enabling me to create a collection that acted as an anchor. So whilst the conclusion is drawn here, I'm not necessarily able to be generalised, I believe it's an important area of study to pursue. Pop culture produces a wealth of material culture that warrants both archaeological and sociological attention due to its pervasive nature. There are interesting and important questions around our identity, capitalism, and our relationship with mass-produced material culture. Whilst archaeology is doing vibrant and exciting work on video games, it's necessary to also research film and TV and what it produces. No pun intended. Furthermore, autoethnography is a worthwhile and challenging methodology that could help archaeology become a more reflexive discipline. Not only should we recognise that the personal is political, but we should consider the personal to be academic. Thank you for listening.